platform where evidence and, and rationality and reason can be uh, projected to the whole student body and uh, give us an idea of what it is to go after evidence and, uh, and reason and whether we, uh, in other words, uh, have criticism and skepticism on all the, the claims, especially extraordinary claims that are being presented within the society. And we want to have the, the, the right to, to ask those questions and, and determine whether it is right or wrong, whether it, is, uh, the, whether it does map onto reality. Um, uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an organizational psychologist. Uh, I've been in healthcare management for at least last seven years. I've developed uh, teams uh, from a psychological standpoint uh, for efficacy and efficiency for the organizations. Uh, I'm a published author. Um, I'm a lecturer. I've been on TV interviews uh, numerous times for the last several years, uh, talking about ancient history, uh, language, uh, prehistory actually as well, and human migrations and so on. So my interest came through uh, when I started examining uh, ancient history, and I saw that whatever we are being presented right now is actually much different than what we can find through evidence. And, uh, through uh, basically going the deeper into language and mythology and so on. So, as of course, as you start reading the, the, the Bible, the Quran, and the, the Rig Veda of the Hindus, uh, the, the Book of the Dead of the Egyptians, and try to decipher the petroglyphs and so on, you can see uh, how today's basically religion will, will become tomorrow's mythology. In other words, yesterday's religion was is today's mythology, and, and so on. So you can see, it's, it's not really, an original idea. Uh, the, the idea has maintained the same and it's going forward uh, in a the cultural tangent, you might say. So, um, one of the things I want to talk about is what it is uh, to be an atheist or the idea of an atheism because uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there and misconception of what atheism means. Uh, the word itself is already, a, you might say, it has a negative connotation. Well, that's because it comes from a theist standpoint. It, it's when it comes to it being a negative thing. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, I think free thinker uh, is, is a good representation because we can uh, approach certain things without offending anybody. Uh, you know, secularist, humanist, and so on. All these ideas uh, can be a part of the, 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 the atheism uh, as a term itself. So basically, atheism, what it is, is basically we're trying to uh, be a little bit skeptical of yeah. Okay, but okay. Uh, basically, just to uh, a little bit skeptical of the extraordinary claims that are being presented through, through religion. And, uh, I mean, <clears throat> you have the right uh, to, to believe what you want to believe, but uh, when it comes to us respecting that right, uh, has to be has to actually on equal plane. In other words, uh, I, I do respect your belief, but uh, I need to also examine those beliefs to see whether it does map onto reality, in other words. Uh, so, uh, the opinion is always there, uh, we have to establish an even playing field uh, for us to have a normal discourse. In other words, we want to have an intelligent conversation regarding all these ideas, especially extraordinary claims. I mean, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, I mean, if, if, for example, if Hindus uh, have their own gods, for instance, uh, they have, uh, they lose very little sleep over, let's say, gods of the Christians and, and the Muslims. They don't even think about their gods at all. Uh, same thing, so in other words, everybody is an atheist toward another religion, in a sense. Uh, so it, it, it really doesn't have a negative connotation if you really, th if you really think about it. So, that's the reason why I think it is vital for students to even come in to have a normal discourse, uh, a conversation without even offending anybody. You, actually, we can have a normal conversation without offending a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. Uh, especially when uh, we are more informed about history, how religion has evolved. Uh, 
I have examined uh, ancient history for the last 10 years, and you can see that every religion is taken from older cultures and older mythologies. Uh, for, for instance, uh, Judaism is taken from Egyptian and Hindu mythology. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that cannot be found in older uh, cultures and so on. Uh, same thing with Islam, same thing with Christianity. Uh, the ideas are not original. You can find everything before its time. And so of course, uh, when something comes forward or is being introduced as a new religion, you tend to destroy the past. In other words, you try to hide as, as much as things as possible to make your representation look, look better. Uh, that happened in the 4th and 5th centuries when Christianity started uh, going through towns and countries to uh, spread the message. Well, they even went all the way to Egypt and they destroyed petroglyphs and they destroyed and they plastered all the uh, Egyptian pyramids and so on. And uh, Bishop Christostom was actually one of the ones who boasted about that. He said Christianity destroyed all the Western philosophy altogether. And he was happy about it. And uh, you have to understand that in every certain period of time, those people are thinking rationally based on what they believe. For them, that's what reality is all about, based on their belief at, at, at a certain point. So my point is, is basically to, for us to have an open discourse and understand what all these religions are talking about and to approach it from a natural standpoint, from a historical standpoint, from a rational, intellectual, honesty standpoint. I mean, we really need to be honest about whether we're talking about evidence or whether we're talking about a motive need for something to be true. Um, when I was going through my rounds at my uh, doctoral program, I, I've spoke with religious people, I spoke with uh, non-believers, and it's interesting how they represent their viewpoint. Uh, based on their religion or based on their non-belief as well. So I, in a way, look at everybody as the potential to be a rational person. Uh, I mean, everybody is skeptical and rational in almost all aspects of their life. I mean, you buy a house, you want to be rational, you read the, the legal terms, try to understand whether they're trying to trick you or not. But when it comes to religion, all bets are up. You can believe whatever you want to believe, the extraordinary claims. And uh, th it's not only that, you expect the other person to understand your perspective. And if not, then it becomes a problem. Then you are agitated, then you become antisocial and so on. You can see that it's the same thing as, let's say, a person being rejected from another uh, uh, woman or a man. When you want to invite them to dinner and they say no, you feel rejected, antisocial. Same thing happens to a theist, uh, and, and vice versa. So I think that you know we, uh, as rational human beings, uh, we have to approach this um, decisively. And the the time for respecting uh, men of all absurdity has long passed. In other words, we're in the 20, 21st century, uh, and uh, we have this enormous knowledge base. We know right now about genetics. We know about archaeology. We know different ways of dating uh, certain items. We know that the, the Earth is billions of years old. I mean, some people still believe that Earth is six to 8,000 years old. That's absurd. Uh, and solely based on whatever the book says. But, you know, I have been in labs where how they test certain material. And it's, it's all independent. In other words, you have independent and conver convergent evidence that certain things are old without any collaboration whatsoever. Everybody comes to the same conclusion. So, uh, the, the, the club that you're in, or, uh, or you're inquiring about what the club is, uh, club is all about, I think it's, a, it's a something to be uh, thankful for. And uh, you know, thank you for the school for having that opportunity because uh, we can start having an even balance between uh, religious and secular thought. I think we can find a common ground as long as we are not fundamentalists. Uh, you know, you can have an atheist who is fundamentally uh, pushing forward their ideas, and that requires evidence as well. But you know, the burden of proof is based on or is uh, hinged upon the person who's making the extraordinary claim. 
And unless we understand this, uh, we are going to consider that all claims are sh or should be considered as something valid. Uh, I mean, you have actually people that believe certain things that a lunatic would believe. But when it comes, when it becomes a religion, then all of a sudden we cannot question anymore because it is mandated. Uh, I mean, if you look at the history of all religion, usually it's through the sword, through bloodshed. And after a while, it, it, it dies down. Um, we see all these atrocities uh, in Syria right now, in the Muslim countries. Uh, you see, two days ago, a woman was stoned to death because she had a cell phone. Uh, you have in Syria right now, where a lot of Christians are dying uh, because of uh, the Muslim faith. Christianity did the same thing a thousand years ago on Muslims and Jews. So uh, just because we don't have the same videos as we did, let's say, today as opposed to a thousand years ago, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Of course it did. Um, we, we have evidence that a lot of things were destroyed. Um, we, we should be lucky that we have even evidence from the Greek, uh, from the Persian, from the Armenian culture. Uh, from pre-Christian times. Well, there is a reason why. You know, you have all this destruction going through and everybody is trying to uh, hide whatever uh, is against somebody's faith. And, uh, you know, for, for powerful people, you know, we think it can be understood that maybe even religion is a matter of controlling the masses and so on. Uh, and it certainly does. I mean, uh, they want the children uh, to be indoctrinated into that. I mean, if you allow a person just to be exposed to scientific evidence until the age of 18, and then present them the Bible or the Quran, I don't think they're going to believe it. But you need children. Uh, same thing as a child. The child actually believes there's a Santa Claus. Actually believes there's a Santa Claus. The same way as an adult believes in, in Allah, or, uh, or Yahweh, or, or Jesus Christ. The same way. And it's all based on how you were raised. And it's geographically based too. I mean, we are here, Christians or Jews, because of our, of our environment where we grew. I mean, if we were born in India, we would have been Hindus. Very natural. I mean, there are people in Aborigine uh, Australia that they have no idea what's going on. They haven't even heard of Virgin Mary or, or the, uh, or the uh, ideas in the Rig Veda or the Quran. They have no idea. So for them, they can live and die and not even know what's, what's happening in the, in the other side of the world. So we have to understand that whatever we're exposed to, that is the idea that helps us to become who we are. And I think that we have the, the potential as the citizens of the 21st century to look at all evidence and to decide whether something can be uh, examined or something that we can find evidence for and then go from there. So, um, do you have any questions so far? I mean, I will welcome your questions because I think we have more questions than answers at this point. I mean, you got a question? Yes. Uh, how do you feel about faith? Is there anything good about the idea of faith? Uh, well, I think that's it's a good question because faith has various dimensions. It depends on the, 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 the setting that we're using faith, the word faith. Um, I mean, I can hope, let's say, that I win the lottery. Uh, but it's not really faith. Uh, faith in a religious standpoint, basically you're saying that I believe something based on no evidence whatsoever. Otherwise you'll say I know. Either you know or you don't. Uh, if you want to have faith, let's say, that your sister will come uh, to the Christmas party, that's a totally different thing. But when we use faith in a religious standpoint, we really are saying that whatever evidence is, Whatever people say, I'm going to hold on to my beliefs based on what I was taught. And normally, if you really think about it, it's based on fear. Uh, my child came home uh, crying uh, one day because uh, I take her to learn uh, other languages and it's next to a church. Uh, so for an hour, they take them up you know, for uh, religious teaching. And then they taught her that uh, if you don't uh, love your mother or father, uh, you will go to hell. Now, if she's six or seven years old, that's already fear instilled in the child. Now, even if evidence comes true that 
let's say you shouldn't believe that, she already has that fear already. She's going to question that for the rest of her life. So I think that we're doing a positive thing, uh, not even just to talk about eradicating all religion, but basically giving the, the child the opportunity to look at the positive things of questioning things. Uh, you know, I, ch I tell my child to question everything, including me, whatever I say, uh, because I can be wrong. And yes. Yeah, good. Um, do, what about moral absolutes? Mm -hmm. Are, without religion, mm -hmm. um, let's say that you have, you're training, or you're teaching your children to question everything, uh -huh. to not take anything at its face value, then what about moral absolutes? How do you instill in kids that it's wrong to steal or wrong to rape? Can you have a moral society without a religion that unifies everybody? Um, and if so, what about other religions that might say that it's morally acceptable to do something that people from another cultural religion say it's morally unacceptable? Mm -hmm. So it comes back to, are there moral absolutes? Very good. Uh, did you hear that? Are there any moral absolutes? Uh, that's a very good question. There are no moral absolutes. I, I think the cl something the closest, closest thing that comes to a moral absolute is me doing something good for the whole soul. Uh, you giving something back in return. Uh, in other words, I'm not going to hurt you and I expect that to be returned back to me. That's the closest we can come to a moral absolute. Um, who has read the Bible here? I mean, from front to back. Actually read the Bible, not cherry picking it. Read it. Okay, who has read uh, the Tanakh or the Torah? Tanakh, all the way through. Who has read the Quran? Who has read the Rig Veda? Indian Rig Veda. Okay. Uh, when I say whoever's read it, in other words, when you read it, uh, especially the, uh, the Abrahamic religion, uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and, and, and the Quran, Almost half of it is genocide, sexism, murder, and rape, and stoning, and stuff like that. Uh, these were written by people who used to put babies in post holes for the temple not to crumble based on, based on earthquakes. Uh, and you have other very good precepts in there, but they are not really original. I mean, do you really uh, have to read the Bible for it to not to kill your neighbor? I mean, if, if you read the Ten, the ten Commandments, actually it was 20 commandments. There were 20 of them. Uh, if you look at the numbers and the Genesis, it changes. And also, the, even the commandments themselves are a copy of a 2000, previously 2,000 year old Akkadian and Assyrian scripts. So it's not really original. You can even read the Egyptian. In other words, they try to relay a, a, a way of, of living, but I don't think that I need the, the commandments or anything like that, or the fear of God, for instance, for me to uh, and not hurt anybody, in other words. So I think that there are ways of understanding that you know we cannot really hurt the child. And I mean, um, Professor Weinberg uh, said a good thing, he's a physicist. He said, you know, there will be good people who will do good things and bad things who do bad things, but for good people to do bad things, we need religion. Uh, there is truth in that. I mean, when your holy book gives you the authority, the ticket, to stone a woman of having a cell phone, then basically that potentially good person can kill somebody based on faith alone. Uh, we had, you know, our, our Christian fathers, uh, Augustus, uh, Augustine, uh, St. Augustine, uh, he said that, you know, women are inferior and uh, the heretics should be burned alive. And that was the reason why you had the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisitions. Millions of people died, and we're not even talking about Islam. Right now we're talking about Islam, but before, a lot of Christians killed a lot of people. Burned children, uh, burned women, uh, they thought they were witches. Just like a child would believe in Santa Claus, they believed nationally in witches, so they killed women. For them, that was the reality. So unless we understand the, the horrific style of religion and we put that away, you know, I think that there are very good moral precepts in, in all the religious books, but it doesn't really need to become from religion. I mean, if you, read, if you read the Nicomachean ethics, that predates the Bible 500 years. 
So we can't find morality in much older literature than the, the religious 